this gentleman to the left of me, who goes by the name of Tony Andrews, is the man behind Function One, a brand that came to some prominence in the last few years, um, as being, for instance, the main sound system at Berlin's Berghain, um, Cielo in New York, a few churches somewhere, an opera house here and there. Space Ibiza. Space Ibiza, for those people who spent their summers on that island. So, yeah, and he has quite a long history when it comes to sound, sound systems, is opinionated about the quality of sound, and we're going to hear from him about it. So please, welcome, <laughs> Mr. Tony Andrews. So before we end up at function one and sound quality and signal chains and distortion and all these things, how does one get into the business of building a loudspeaker? Thank you. I, I, if you're asking when I, when I, when I started, um, it started with an interest in hi-fi and um, didn't have much money when I was 16, 17, so I, I bought some speakers and built my own boxes and um, just began to investigate st stereo, if you, if you like. Um, the first thing that I remember really strongly was uh, Jimi Hendrix, Electric Ladyland. Had some of the most amazing uh, stereo panning. That's, uh, I don't quite understand why we don't do more of it today, but anyway, it was very exciting to us. And um, so I guess I started making, after I'd learned about hi-fi, I, I think, you know, bands touring and uh, it was relatively new then. And the idea occurred to me that what we, what we need is the sound for a band to be like, like hi-fi quality. So I guess that's the, that's the kind of mission that I decided I was going to get into, to try to um, get hi-fi quality at r really loud levels. Um, and this is back in 1970, 71. And the first... Um, first touring band I worked with when I made my own system was uh, actually the Pink Fairies and they were supported by a band called Hall Queens who you probably will have heard of. Um, it's one of those instances where the really good band broke up and the, the support band became, if you like, a stronger thing. Hawkwind, for those who might not know, was the band a certain Lemmy started in, right? And he went on to form a group called Motorhead which ended up to be the loudest band on earth. Well, Arguably. that's what they'd like to think. But as I'm sure we're all know, we all know, it's not about level, it's about quality. Yeah, we're going to hear about that. And w were you making music yourself, or were you just interested in the scientific aspects of it? Oh, when I was about 16, I had a bass guitar, and uh, to be perfectly honest, I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the front to get up on stage and do that. I was too nervous, believe it or not. So, but I always found myself fixing the things that got broken, and uh, so it kind of developed that way. So, and you're you're also self-taught, right? And that, yeah. I mean, I had a background in um, physics, and you know, I did reasonably well academically. I uh, got a place at university, which lasted about three weeks, um, because. <laughs> I just couldn't stand the idea of sitting there taking notes and then having to remember them four months later because I'd been doing that for years and uh, I just couldn't take it anymore. And anyway, there was a psychedelic explosion at the time and everybody, um, um, you know, where it was at was, um, was the music. So that's what attract another thing that attracted me to it. And, and do you remember that first loudspeaker you built? Did you model it after a, a certain loudspeaker you couldn't afford, or was it just you played it by ear? No, completely played it by ear. Um, I didn't, I didn't understand all sorts of things at the time. But you know, you try things out, just like you're doing music. You try them out, you listen to them, you see, you see how it makes you feel. Um, and I guess this is how we learnt about bass. Um, 
we we had one of the one of the original hi-fi speakers, and we were playing around in the, in the room, and my brother put it in a corner, and of course all the mids and highs disappeared, but there was this sudden big improvement in the bass, so. We went out into the garage and we built the corner of a room and I thought, well, the corner of the room isn't a good shape. Let's turn it round, let's reverse it. And that's how the first bin evolved. Um, so in a way you could say it's an accident, but when accidents happen, um, it's like good to observe what's occurred. And if it doesn't make sense, then find out why. And, or if there's something interesting, see if you can't pursue it further. And you pursued it further. Like yeah, very much so. And when did it occur to you to, yeah, before Function One there was another another brand you did, and when did it, it did it occur to you to actually make this your living? Not only go on tour with bands, but manufacture your own sound equipment for them. Well, in the seventies, um, we were a rental company. And in those days, most rental companies built their own equipment. And we worked with bands like Santana, um, Jackson Brown, Iron Maiden, um, later on, Call in the Gang, people like that. So at that in the 70s, everybody was building their own equipment. And uh, we, we just evolved our ideas. Um, one of the things we were completely concerned about was the the compression drivers that get used for mid-range and high frequencies to this day in fact um, they're only small metallic diaphragms when you give them a lot of pressure it just goes to rag you know it just rags out it um, goes n or technically you'd say it goes non-linear it's not faithfully reproducing um, it's adding up to maybe 40 or 50 percent of its own sound which is distortion so we started looking at cone drivers for mid mid range uh, probably about 74 by 76 we'd had the first turbo which is a way of organizing the waves from a cone driver a bit like in 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 the same principle that um, a phase plug in a compression driver do you guys know anything about the basics of um, uh, loudspeakers and the various types that get used. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm, yeah. Okay, let's try another an, another angle then. When you go into a club, and it feels like there's a chainsaw taking your ears off, that's a compression driver um, going into its clipping, not clipping like the meters going into the red, which everybody can do quite happily. It's clipping mechanically. It just can't hold its integrity. So this was an obvious weak point in, um, in, in getting loud sound strongly. Why, why do you have them then in the first place when they have the effect of a chainsaw? Ah, because they're very good converters of electrical energy into acoustic output. In other words, their efficiency is high. And um, what could we say here? Like a direct radiator, say like a 12 inch speaker would have a really high efficiency one, would have a, a measurement of say 100 or 101 dB for one watt, one meter. This is, a, this is a sensitivity figure. So sensitivity is about how much of your amplifier energy is being turned into acoustic output. So. Um, typical, I guess th these speakers would be probably 92 or 93. They won't be very efficient. The typical home speaker is maybe about 3 or 4 percent um, efficient, which is really low. And uh, the fact truth is 100 acoustic watts in the air is enough to kill you. Just to give you an idea of how inefficient the majority of loudspeakers are. So the compression driver has an efficiency approaching maybe 30%. So it's, you know, it, you get, in other words, you get a lot of sound out of it. But the problem with it is you get the high efficiency, but you get masses of distortion. So you can, and distortion is 
something that bothers me greatly. And I, um, right from the beginning, it seemed to be the, r the wrong thing. So, so the thing was, can we replace the compression driver with something that is as efficient, but doesn't suffer from all the horrible sound they can make? And so cone drivers, uh, paper is an organic material. It's much more natural. It's closer to the speed of sound in air than, than say, metal. Um, you've only got to think of a dustbin and the clangy sound it makes. So, and then you think of something like a guitar body, which is made out of wood, or a violin. These are, if you like, more natural human sounds. And the speed of sound in organic materials is, again, closer to, to what it is in air. So, so a metal diaphragm is, is actually a not a very nice thing. Um, and all compression drivers have this. They used to be aluminium. These days, they're titanium because uh, it's longer lasting, stronger. So we started evolving, if you like, uh, cone driver mid-range probably in the mid-70s. And uh, we've been continuing that evolution to the, to the very present day. Um, we've understood more and more how to load a cone driver to get the maximum amount of energy with the minimum amount of distortion. So, you know, we've reached a point now where the speakers are, even at high level, are clean enough that we, we start looking, and have done for a long time, further up the chain, up to the very beginning of the, uh, of the music making process. And, um, well, maybe I'll, I'll let Gerd answer that. So when you when you talk about uh, that back in the day, the problem was to get the right loudspeakers, right? To manufacture them, yeah. and now you have them, we, more or less. More or less yeah. And where's the problem now? It's okay. so the so the problem these days is that it seems to have reversed, and um, a lot of the a lot of the problem has come with the um, with the arrival of digital, and. Let me say it right from the beginning that actually digital can be as good, even better than analog. But there are more things that have to be considered and, and, and got correct with digital than there is with analog. Analog is in some ways a lot simpler and, and easier. So, you know, then we have the, then we have the World Wide Web and uh, in the beginning, the bandwidth was, uh, as we know, was very, very narrow, quite small. Bit rate was um, was low. Storage space was incredibly expensive. So the so the MP3 got in, invented, more or less as a holding situation, as a stopgap until things could grow up. Problem with these sorts of things is that they become bad habits and um, reinforced by um, iTunes. Everybody says Steve Jobs great, but he didn't do anything for audio. I'm telling you, he, d he didn't. Um, but like before we speak about the, the audio quality kind of thing, maybe you could explain, as they are not very familiar with the whole sound system thing, what's the main difference between an analog sound system and a digital sound system? The main difference, well, the main the main difference in today's world and experience is that the, the I'm afraid digital can sound very um, can sound quite harsh. Um, a lot of the depth and the texture of the sounds is missing um, because they don't they don't take all the information. You need, I mean, you can do some simple sums like. Um, what is the dynamic range of human hearing? Well, it's going to be zero to the threshold of pain. And pain kicks in at about 135 to 140 dB. That is really, really loud. I mean, a nice, a nice full-on listening level is probably about 100 to 105. So, so if you like, there's 135 dB of dynamic range available to human hearing. So bit depth is... Um, how we how we measure digital dynamic range. So eight bit depth is gonna have a very 
quite narrow dynamic range. In other words, the loud bits are only going to be so loud and the quiet bits. The difference between the, the quiet and the loud bits is not going to be so much. So if you, if you do the maths, it, it kind of comes out at about 24-bit depth is actually translates to about the same range as human hearing in terms of dynamics. So the bit depth is a dynamic range, and I guess you know, know this, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. The, so the sample rate is the amount of slices taken through time. And considering the fact that um, the human auditory system can discern time differences down to 15 microseconds, not milliseconds, so it's um, 15 millionths of a second has, has a meaning for the human auditory system. And the, the ear is not this funny shape for no reason. There, there, there's a purpose to, to all the, the little curves and, and the shape of it. And it's to do with um, vector location. I guess when we were on the plains of Africa or in the jungles, and certainly at night, the eyes were not going to help us if we were if we were going to become prey of some predator, or maybe it's food. But if you hear a sound, um, you don't have to see to know where it where it where it is. And I guess when you're in the jungle, um, you you're relying more on your auditory sense. So the audio system for humans is incredibly well developed. Um, the fact that we can you, inst you instantly know where something's going. Even if you're blindfolded, when you walk into a room, you will know it. When you walk out of the room outside, you will know it. Because the processing is always on. It never, ever stops. And that's, guess why, if you're in a bad acoustic environment, like uh, uh, a pizza place with tiled floor, hard walls and ceiling, glass, um, somebody puts a fork down, everybody hears it. Everybody's shouting because they're trying to get their voice across to their friend above the general noise. If you're in a, a room such as this one, which is acoustically reasonably dead, it's a, it's a pleasant acoustic environment, it's not hard work to exist in it. And you, this is something that's always there, always with us. The outcome of being in a bad acoustic environment for a couple of hours is that you begin to feel irritable and you start to feel tired because the processor is just on all the time. And we're just not aware of it um, in, a, in a, such a conscious way, but we feel the results, which is tiredness. And um, architects don't ever think about the acoustic properties of their space that they're designing. They should, because the acoustic properties make for the, the mood and the feeling and the ambience of a place. And, um, you know, it's good to pay attention. For example, the, the, the nice little huts that you've got around the place here for, for doing music. Um, they're, they're great because the walls are all different angles, so you don't get any standing waves. But it would, it, it would be quite an improvement if there were, say, some, some just cloth in the ceiling to absorb the high frequencies. Because high frequencies... Um, reflections spoil your perception of the stereo image and when you're mixing you want to be hearing just the speakers assuming that they're reasonably truthful and not glamorizing or underplaying so that you know a, a, a good reference so that when you go out there it's not miles away from whatever the average is but I mean if you go out there and play there's all sorts of things you're going to encounter so there has to be kind of a ground zero and that's what a studio is for, so to be a, be a reference. And that would you also recommend for the bedroom studios at home to have just a little bit cloth? I certainly ceiling. would. I mean, it's not rocket science acoustics. You just want things that absorb so the sound doesn't come back. Because, you know, with the speed of hearing and everything, you pick up that reflection. It, um, it, it spoils your perception just from the loudspeakers. And in fact, you don't even want to hear the loudspeakers. You want to hear the result. So when I'm listening to a system, I've got my test tracks. Um, I put them on. I get in the middle of the speakers. How well does the sound stage 
And I mean, this is, this is the key thing as to why audio quality is so important, because the, it, it can be a transcendent spiritual experience, because when, when something, when you become part of something to the extent that you can with audio and good music and a, and a good sound, your mind, your mind can open. I'm not saying it's it, it's um, it's going to follow exactly, but many people have this experience, which is why there are high fine nutcases in the world, I guess. Um. And why do you think your loudspeakers are so popular with clubs or electronic music in in general? Well. They're popular in clubs because, mostly in clubs, um, people are not suffering from the politics of the, of the live touring world. It used to be a pioneering thing. When we were in it in the 70s, it was, a, it was a very different category of people. Now that, we see, we don't do a line array. Um, I won't... What is a, li what is a line array? Um, it's the strip of speakers you see each side of the stage when you go into a concert. And they're all of a certain kind. They're actually quite e easy to fly. Um, so, but as a way of doing big audio, they're actually extremely flawed. Um, you're never going to get the precision that we're talking about. When you, you, sh you should, you should be able to do better than these in a big concert. It's easy with one speaker to um, to get a reasonably good result, especially if your room is okay. But if you if you've got lots of speakers, they really take some organising to, if you like, sing off the same page. They've all got to be in time. They've got to be in sync. It's a bit like when you're rowing a boat. Everybody has to row together at the same time. But why is the line array method then so popular with live music? Well, because we live in a world now which is dominated by um, a convenience rather than production values so in clubs they don't they don't have all these these ideas i mean the live world is incredibly political when you've got glamour and um, celebrity people start it's not so much the celebrities but all the people around start going a bit crazy and um and so you d this kind of madness develops where actually i can honestly say that the sound at concerts today is not as good as it was 25 years ago when it was more analog and line arrays didn't exist. That's that's my opinion about it. Um, clubs like our stuff because they're just listening to audio. They want a they want obviously strong bass that's musical. When you play a bass line that's got various notes in it, it does all of them. It doesn't doesn't do just one note. Um, the mids are, um, if you like, clean and strong. Um, it's, it's the distortion levels. The, we've got the, we've got, we can get loud sound really, really clean. And the high frequencies are very pure because the crossover point is, is high. What's a crossover point? Crossover point is the, is the here, there, will, there will be a crossover, there will be two crossovers in this, not to mention probably a load of processing, but between the bass speaker and the mid-range, there will be one crossover. And between the mid-range and the high frequency, there'll be another. I mean, um, so oh, I, I thought about something as I said that. See, there's another thing about audio. We talked about how fast it is, uh, how how important timing is, and how deep we can perceive the differences in time arrivals. Um, but also, it's the breadth of um, the audio spectrum it's it's like it's 10 octaves wide all the colors we see are in the are of the rainbow and the rainbow is one octave so although um, lights electromagnetic waves and sound is waves of compression and rare refraction everything in the universe seems to be built built on a on an octave and so there's one octave of light. So with one light bulb, you can get all the all the light you need, all the full spectrum, which when you add it all together becomes white. 
uh, it's incredibly difficult to do that with 10 octaves, which is why sound systems are split into bass speakers, mid and high, and sometimes low, mid and high, mid and high. And my mind, if you go much beyond that, A, it's probably not necessary, and that you complicating it to a point where um, you could probably get more problems and good results. But four-way system is about, about the maximum. But the reason you have to do this is because a bass wave is easily as long as this room, and a high-frequency wave is about this long. So we're talking huge orders of magnitude difference. The difference between red light and violet light is not, um, is not much. We just see this narrow spectrum. If we saw the whole of magnetic spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, we probably wouldn't be able to walk anywhere without bumping into something. Um, it would be too much. So the windows of perception that we have as humans, um, well, they're what they are and they've evolved the way they are. But we have, we have 10 octaves in sound, so it's very, very broad. It's also 360 degrees, and your vision is, is a, actually, your reading vision is a very narrow cone directly in front of the eyes. Um, peripheral vision probably goes out to about here, but with, with audio, it's completely 360 the whole time. So, in a way, I may, may, maybe I've under, given a reason as to why speaker systems are often divided up into bass, mid, and treble. And, uh, and the crossover is the thing that takes the full range spectrum and divides it into bass, low, mid, high, mid, and treble. That's what a crossover does. And these days, because of digital, which is a really positive thing about digital, it enables us to also delay the time by some milliseconds, because the, the bass, I don't know if they do that with these, but these, where these are starting from is not in the same place. It's not all on a flat plane. So the, the time adjustment moves, will, will delay the one that's in front to be at the same point as the one in the back. Because our hearing is that discerning that we will hear, we will hear that that isn't right. We won't go, oh, the timing's wrong on that. We'll just go, okay, so it's all right, but it's not it's great sound. To get great sound, all frequencies need to arrive at almost at the split microsecond together um, because of this timing sensitivity that we have. Yeah, uh, everyone who ever played in a club without monitors uh, can maybe feel you on that. Well, when it comes to trying to time the beat for the yeah, next record. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then as you soon the as you're in, you wonder, what did I do wrong? It sounded right <laughs> just a second ago. You have that delay. Yeah, you, you do. And um, we have to s quite often we have to take any time delay off the monitors because some DJs are really sensitive to it. And, I mean, they're hearing, they're hearing a meter of, um, you know, if um, sound travels 11... Well, I know it's 1,100 feet per second. I think that's about 376 meters per second. And so it's, um, it's quite slow. So you really have to, do, do have to pay attention to it if you're making a sound system. But that's not what you guys are doing, is it? You're, you're making mu music, I guess. Yeah, um, but some of them play that music in clubs. Yeah, well... If you know if you know about a sound system and you put your music on and you go out and listen to it and it doesn't sound right, then maybe you can do something about fixing it. Because quite honestly, um, there's there is a great lack of good sound engineers in the world in general. Um, there aren't so, there aren't so many. Um, and well, that's all I can say really. I don't want to be rude. Um, you don't name names, so that's okay. Um, what else could we say, really? Tons, really. Keep out of the rats. Okay, so... Assuming the sound system's okay, and there's an engineer who's got it nicely dialed in for the room. Um, I mean, any room's got a nice working level. Um, too little and you don't get enough excitement. Too much and you start to crush people. Especially if it's distorted. So the idea here is to try and keep the sound as clean as possible. I know 
that um, you know some kinds of distortion are actually part of the m of the, m the musical thing. You're, you're not talking about the Jimi Hendrix kind of distortion, right? No, because that was his that was his sound, and um, it was it was um, even harmonic distortion. You know, it's actually quite pleasant. Um, whereas the distortion you get from, say, not just a bad sound card, of which most of them are not, are, are not much good, um, it's also overloading it. So, um, now that kind of distortion has got a lot of square waves in it. They're not natural. Um, the ear doesn't like them. Um, I know we're living in a world where, you know, it's quite a lot of ugly things are considered good. Um, but I can't come to terms with distortion as being um, a beneficial thing to the to the average human, and it's you know it's in everything from MP3s to bad sound cards to uh, bad original samples. So for me, it's um, the most important thing is to have a good beginning, so it's a nicely recorded vocal. Um, or it's a good sample, it's a good quality. When you're mixing it, your levels want to be just right. They don't want to be too quiet. Um, they don't want to be too loud because when it's clipping and in the red, that's what you get. You get that, that horrible crunchy sound. If you do this half a dozen times, you've not got much left. And then you listen to it and you think, well, it doesn't even... Because it's not just that you've got distortion, which is um, non-linearities, artifacts, things that never belonged in the, f in the original signal in the first place. It's, it's the fact that the clean side of it is missing, the depth, the, all the information that can make sound so, such a beautiful experience. Um, when, when the sound is good, it's like um, you want to open yourself to it. When it's bad, it, it drives you away. It's like something to avoid. So good samples, good beginnings, um, sensible gain structure all the way through, um, keeping the life in it. Um, an 8-bit sample will not have all the information that a piano's got into it, all the harmonics. Um, for instance, an MP3, even at 320 kilobytes per second, has only got 20% of the information of, of, a C of a CD quality. So if you translate CD quality, which is 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz, into kilobytes per second, it comes out, I think, at about 1,410. So if you think a so-called so high-quality MP3 is 320 kilobytes per second, that makes a CD five times more information. So obviously, some uh, lots of stuff is going to be missing, and I'm not an expert on digital, but I know that it's looking for significant bits. And there's a level which an MP3 will just reject any any information that is below a certain level in the mix, which means that all your subtle harmonics are gone; um, they're not there anymore. And the effect on the sound is like if you're looking at a uh, a two-dimensional picture or really being in the place. And that, to me, is another reason why audio quality is so important. It's a multi-dimensional experience when it's really good. When it's, when it's bad, it's just, it might as well be somebody s put paint on a wall. It's not, um, it's not the full thing. And I am concerned that generally in the world, the the appreciation of this is going downhill. And it's a combination of um, bad use of digital and, um, y you know, such as MP3s, and actually line arrays at concert have lowered the expectation. iPods have got people to a point where they almost prefer the sound of an iPod to, to uh, real, real audio. And... Quite often when engineers get on a function one system when they're doing a live band, it actually frightens them because if you move an EQ, you, you get a response. 
it's kind of like taking a guy who's been driving, I don't know, a Ford Focus, you know, a pretty standard car, and putting him in a Formula R Formula One car. They're actually quite hard to dr drive because they're so sensitive. You have to be careful. You have to m know what you're doing. But if you do, you can get the most amazing results live. In fact, good live in a in a decent room um, can be better than anything that's recorded because the 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 number of stages between the original and the final result is 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 at a minimum. Um, so to expand on that particular point, every time you take your your audio and you put it through a processor or you you copy it from one file format to another unless the mathematics is perfect and the algorithms are wonderful it's going to be degraded and it's always been there that the minimum number of stages between the beginning and the end will always give you the best audio it's very hard to hold on to all these subtle things that make that make a Steinway piano a Steinway and a, a cheap copy a cheap copy. Um, most people could tell the difference, but one they're both pianos, you know, and and you can so a, so a line array will give you sound, but it won't necessarily give you any more than a, a very two dimensional result. But what do I do if I have a bad back and I don't want to carry records around? So. Or I'm all about efficiency, you know, and I just want to travel with two USB sticks in my pocket. Okay, so if you've got a collection of vinyl and uh, you want to... So the first thing to do would be to translate it into digital. So you get yourself a good record deck um, and you put, say, a, an Autofon moving coil cartridge on it because they're one of the nicest sounding cartridges you can get. Don't necessarily use a DJ cartridge because they'll be built for strength, not necessarily finesse. So you put that into the only things I know that are going to work nicely um, is an Apogee, a Prism, or or this little box, which is uh, I think about 150 euros, and it's from Echo, and uh, it's very nearly if not as good as a prism or an apogee in terms of somehow they've got the right chips with the right mathematics and the audio that comes out of these things is is really quite amazing and we use it to judge all other sound cards with and so if you use a really good analog to digital converter and you get it down at 24 or 96 you're you've got it in digital format Then you need to, then when you play, and you know, Tractor or any of these will play any kind of WAV file. Or Is MP3. someone here using Tractor? And the rest is Serato, right? So, so mm -hmm. something to tell you about Tractor. We were, we were, we were quite amazed at this, and we only learned it a couple of years ago. The um, we were asked to evaluate the um, the tractor sound card and we came back with a report that wasn't that wasn't happy at all so, um, so other companies come to you for th they do yeah because we're because our thing is audio and function one is our personal expression of our quest for good audio um, people tend to see us as um, if you like a yardstick a measurement um, so people send us amplifiers, what do you think of this? They send us sound cards, and native instruments did. And when we told them what we found, they, um, they were quite concerned. And they came over and visited. And through the course, I mean, they heard what we heard, um, which was, you know, a fairly degraded sound, just playing a well-recorded WAV file. And they began to suspect the software. And, uh, and so at that point, I got introduced to Fubar, which sadly doesn't play on. It doesn't. There isn't a Mac version, but it's a uh, it's a free it's a shareware um, file player. There's a Mac version. Hooray! Well, thing about 
Fubar is, is just a straightforward player. There's no tricks, bells or whistles. It's not phoning up somebody saying who you can share it with. It's just playing the, the music. And it does it really, really well. And when we played the same tracks with the Fubar through the Native Instrument sound card, actually, it was pretty good. Not quite as good as the Echo, but, but pretty damn good. So it was in the software. And this is the, th this is the thing to remember about all software. Um, two weeks later, they came back and they said, OK, here, here's what you do. You go, you go into preferences. You go into the mixer section. You, you take the EQ from X zone to classic. And further down on the same mixer list, there is auto leveling and auto limiting, neither of which you, you really need unless you're completely crazy. But I mean, if you're doing this thing, this professionally, you should be at that point. Anyway, you get rid of those because what turns out is that they're adding extra layers of processing, which is actually degrading the sound um, quite substantially. So um, I even think Native Instruments and their later releases, they, s they may well have as standard, you know, the way it arrives, it may be like this now. It may may have the classic EQ in place, and the and the X um, the place in the X zone, and then you you uncheck these things, and then it becomes a more simple file player. So we haven't even got out of the laptop, and already there's things to think about. And I think with Serato, the they have um, the sound card is the dongle for the program. If I'm not wrong, is that? Yeah, so you're kind of stuck with their sound card, which I think up until the last release was pretty bad. And they're not on their own with this bad sound card thing. I mean, some of the Pro Tools sound cards were really, really bad as well. Believe it or not, Pro Tools sound cards were crap, some of them. And um, I think this is what gave Prism a market. Um, it's quite sad that the, you can do all this clever stuff, mixing, recording, and then at the final analysis, when you turn it back into analog, that you can you can take so much of the life away from it by by not having a good because a sound card will usually have um, digital to analog converters in it, and they need to be good. It's not it's not easy to um, to get analog to get the converters to a, a, a decent acceptable quality. Um, it's only recently that it's become something you can do without costing a lot of money, as is proved by this device. Yeah, I mean, c CDs are okay. Um, they're, um, they're certainly better than MP3s. Um, the, the DJM, because if we talk about CDs, well then we automatically talk about Pioneer CDJs. And the 2000 is actually a far better machine than the DJM 1000. DJ 1000, the one that the Mark III, I think. Um, so they can be okay, but you have CD format, and it's got to decode that. And and if you've got a digital input, you can come digitally out of the CD player straight into to the ubiquitous 800, which actually, although it's not offensive, as long as it's not in the red, um, it isn't proper audio at all. So you better, so if you come out of the CDJ um, analog, then you're already using the converters that are in the machine. So, um, you know, they're, a, they're a, a kind of a size of window that the audio can get through. Think of all these stages as whether, I mean, good audio is like, um, it's like cleaning windows. You clean one window and you see there's another one behind it, which is also need cleaning. And you keep going on like that until you, till you, till the light gets in. Um, and pursuing clean sound is, um, you can be really loud, you can be really strong, but it doesn't hurt. It's got no square wave content. I mean, sometimes you you want to put jagged edge sounds in, 
for uh, sensationalism or, or whatever. But um, there's not many people who find that um, a, a great diet. Um, I certainly don't. I don't mind a bit. But, you know, there is a reason why there's a diatonic scale. Um, you know, harmony is everything. So what we you you asked about CD players. Did I did I answer you? Yeah. We we uh, we call at trade shows we 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 always have a demonstration room because demonstrating the equipment is much better than talking about it. So and we feel that people get an experience they're going to remember it. So We've been using an analog preamp that was actually made for us in about 1982, for right up until two years ago. Uh, after discovering Fubar and this nice piece in turning some vinyls into into digital form, then we were burning CDs and still using the analog preamp. But after getting Fubar and finding this sound card, we now go directly from the laptop to the sound card straight into the straight into the crossovers or, or the sound system. We don't even go through a mixer. Um, it's not so easy because you haven't got a fader there, but you know you can use it with a, with a mouse or if you've got a control room, you know it's great. So that is less stages than having a CD going from that to an analog thing and then actually the crossover is digital. so there's another set of converters. So if you're thinking about, how what what the audio has to do, and minimise the number of changes it has to go through on the way to the end result, it's going to retain more of its integrity. I mean, you, it's what I would call signal path integrity. And pretty well every piece of equipment that we ever get, we we set everything at unity gain, and then we we plug the input into the output really quickly because your sonic memory is about three seconds long. That's all you've got to make a decent evaluation. But that's how we, we, we test things in the first place. And if the audio quality's not up to it, it's not worth going any further. So that's the first thing we do with anything that anybody sends us. We put it in the circuit, we take it out of the circuit. It's not always easy to do that, but one way or another, we, pr we try to do it. What Actually would you be your ideal setup if you can uh, A completely influence. dead room with... You know, something at least as dead as this, this room is here. Um, you're never going to be able to have anything but a hard floor. But, I mean, um, well, case in point, this, um, this, this February, Space said to us, look, we've been using the system for seven or eight years. We, we want to raise, raise the game. We want to we wanna do something new and different. So... I came up with a plan, went out there, and I said, look, I'm only going to do this if you treat the ceiling of this place. Because we're standing here talking, and I can hear the, the low mids in my voice coming back down to me. And um, that's just me talking. What's it going to be like when we put 10,000 watts on? And, and that's going to be the flavor of the room. So I will do another step forward on the sound system if you do the ceiling. Well, it, it, turn, it turns out that they thought this was okay. They would do it. They got a nice chap in from Barcelona, and um, he, did a, he did a really nice job. Now, it, but there was an, an observation which um, I was curious about, which is why am I only getting the low mid back from the ceiling? Because this looks like a concrete ceiling. Um, and I should get some high frequency back as well, and I'm not. So when we were actually hanging the stuff in the place, and I was up in the roof, I could see that they'd um, sprayed some of this, um, I don't know, you call it flock, or they'd sprayed some material on the roof, but it was only sufficiently absorbent to take away the high frequencies, but the mids were still there. So when I actually got up in the roof, which was sometime in May, um, that's when I realized why I was getting that reflection. So in your, in your writing room or the place where you're doing stuff, when you walk in and you're talking, listen to what's coming back. If it's a good room, 
and it's nice, the sound, your, the sound of your own voice is going to stay inside your head. If, it, if it's not so good, it will sound like it's all around you coming from every direction. And this is a, a straight away, you, you've already got all the equipment you need to actually uh, about your person to evaluate an acoustic space. You don't need a laptop or a load of um, equipment and microphones and graphs because most uh, real-time analyzers average over, a, um, a l as far as the ear is concerned, a very long period of time because the ear works in microseconds, remember, and consider, so <laughs> the front edges of everything are really, really important. This is, this is known as the transient, if you like, the beginning of the sound. And if, if you were to remove the transient from a violin and a guitar and just played the envelope rather than the beginning, you, it's not easy to tell the difference between those two instruments. So you need the beginning to tell you what it is. And then if you think about intelligibility with speech, it's, it's in the consonants, it's in the, it's in the T's and the, the K, and, and they're all the edges. They're things that give, give stuff edges. If I start mumbling, not talking very clear, it's, it's the consonants that go first. So transient's really, really important. And uh, speakers need to be fast. Um, see, I've, I mean, these are, these are very nice, they're pleasant but I find them a bit slow. I'm used to it being really snappy because over 40 years, this is where me and my partners have finished up thinking that the most excitement and uh, the best part of audio is. And, you know, in the beginning you follow your instincts and, you know, what you feel to be right. If you're lucky, later on you begin to work out what it, what it is that attracts you and maybe wrap some science around it. And I can do that to if I, can, if I sit down and write something, but typically it doesn't make for a very interesting conversation. Um, so I, haven't, I don't go too technical because in the end it is about music, which is about feelings. And to me it's, it's a way to find out more about yourself and personally, I like old school house from, from the 80s to the 90s when there was a very positive feeling, it was very happy, there were some vocals, um, there were key changes, uh, there was some melody. <laughs> um, and, you know, the thing that gets me most, uh, I, I reckon, is the disjointed rhythms, you know, and... Um, I have said to people, well, look, if my heart was to behave like this rhythm, then I would be in hospital. Um, there are certain things that don't change, thank God, for eons. You know, one I and breathing and thinking and your heart beating is one of them. So, you know, that's pretty old, but don't mean to say it's wrong. The thing, the thing we tend to do, like di what I see with the digital thing is that all the good stuff that was understood and learnt uh, during the analog period of audio has been replaced to a quite a large extent by the way digital um, behaves. And back in the 60s, a guy called Marshall McLuhan said the medium is the message. And now we're in the digital age, audio has shifted according to the message of that medium which is that it's actually very fussy. Um, it can be very wrong, and a lot of people have got very used to it. The point I'm making is the digital thing could have taken what was begun with analog further. And I'm, I'm here talking to you guys because it, it's of great concern to me that we, rather than going forward and building on what we understood, we've just swapped one kind of imperfection for another. It actually has not gone forward at this point. But why did it go wrong, in your opinion, then? If the possibilities were all there. <laughs> How deep do you want to go? <laughs> How much time we got? 
I still have a bit. Okay. Um, uh, well, just take the Russian Revolution, for instance, <laughs> <laughs> which began with um, some really apparently good ideals, you know, for the people. And it didn't take long for it to so turn. So on MP3s like Stalin? To um, you? I'm just saying that in the, the default mode of human endeavor is for it to go round in circles. And, and when you're on the other side of a circle, you're actually going in the opposite direction that you started with. And, you know, the so going from the revolution to Stalin is from from communism to fascism um, is a good is a, a glaring example, and it, it, it's just it's kind of human behaviour because we all assume somebody else knows better than we do, or there's somebody else taking care of it. Um, it's not necessarily true, and it, as far as I'm concerned, audio is wide open. It's not been done. Um, it needs to get better. It's um, it's a very uplifting and deep subject, and I guess that's why you're all involved with it. But the musical side is, well, I mean, music in itself is an amazing thing that we have. Um, I, c I can explain why we have such good audio perception and how it helps our survival. But why we why we've come up with music and we've got a scale that sounds in or out of tune um, is, um, is a fascinating question, really, and I'm not saying I know the answer. And, and you still haven't lost the hope for the turning point, then, in the digital age? You think it can still be turned into an advantage for audio? Well, I think, I think the fact that Function One exists with such a strength, uh, despite the fact that we do we do unfashionable line array. I mean, we do we we're un, we don't do line arrays, so we're not in with the fashion. But there's enough people who get our audio quality to 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 make us successful. And the stu the really silly thing is that it's every so what happens then is this. I mean, this is this is the way the world works. Um, if we're quite popular and good in clubs people start putting this idea around that we're no good for live. Because um, they will only use a line array in live. We, uh, we don't have one. That makes it quite hard. But people mark it against us by saying it's no good for live. Well, I can honestly tell you that a good loudspeaker, and this is a good loudspeaker, you can put any kind of music through it and you can appreciate it. It's maybe... Um, yeah, you can do that. Well, any any good sound system is the same. So to say that one sound system is good for one kind of music and another is good for another kind of music is displaying great ignorance, frankly, so about about the subject. So the pigeonholing that goes on with musical styles doesn't apply to loudspeakers? No, only in as much as certain things, like with dance music, if a system's got good bass, then then you could maybe consider it all right for dance music, even if the mid range is pretty pretty shoddy and the hot highs are nasty. But if you if you want to do speech and the human voice, and here's another thing that's come into me head at this point is the thing to evaluate a system on is a good vocal track. It's I I do listen to. Um, dance music, electronic music, on a system. But that's the last thing I do. The first thing I do is listen to a male or a female. In fact, I got both. I got tracks that I know. And I just put them on because the human voice is what we actually listen to most of the time. There are, there are, there are what, nearly 7 billion human voices on the planet, and every one is different. And everybody can recognize their friend's voice or even if you've only met somebody a couple of times. We're really tuned into voices. So if you get to know a good, a good well-recorded vocal track and you put it on your speakers, it's going to tell you an awful lot straight away. You know, a typical thing would be the compression drivers are very forward and they, they give you 3 to 5K much too strongly. This is where, where all the cut in, in, 
in the sound is actually where the, the, the edges of the transient are most, most noticeable. But if you haven't got the stuff below 2K, if you haven't got the wooden frequencies, you, you're missing, you're missing something. And a lot of production now is done like, like this. It's always been present. Um, and I think it's something to do with, uh, are, you, are you guys aware of the Fletcher Munson curve of um, human frequency sensitivity? Well, I'm, I'm not. Well, it's actually not a linear curve. So our sensitivity to various frequencies is quite different. And the peak of it is at four kilohertz, interestingly enough. Um, and bass is actually quite, quite low. So if you look it up, it's nothing, it's certainly not straight. It's kind of all over the place. But the most sensitive region is 4K, which is probably where most of the intelligibility in, in when you're listening to somebody is, is coming from. That's the around 4K is where all the T's and the, and the S's are going to be. So it's if you've got like a vocal and a guitar, which have a kind of similar frequency range, and you try to put them both into the two to five k area, then they're going they're, they're going to be in a conflict. Actually, a guitar can have some really, really lovely frequencies low down, you know, four or five hundred. So to get a nice mix, you don't cram it all into the place where we naturally pay most attention. You you layer it. You put different things in different parts of the spectrum, and that w that way you maintain separation and therefore more information. Um, I've run out again. Should we maybe open it up for some questions? Of course. And here's a microphone. I hope it works. Hi. Um, I got a couple questions, if it doesn't, uh, if people don't mind. Um, I think these are a bit out of my price range, so I'm going to use near fields. And we already have some. Do you have some decent deep for near fields? Okay. Um, I mean, I'm sure the Genelex are okay. Um, just try and think what else comes to mind. I mean, we do make some small loudspeakers, but I took a different approach in that I wanted them to be really good converters, the efficiency thing. And I thought a speaker that's this big is, at, I mean, it's very silly to ask it to do serious bass. So we, what we, what we can do with it though is the definition area in bass, which is sort of around about 100 to 200. So they don't go really deep, but they're really fast and they're pretty even and they will tell you the truth and people have well, actually, DJ Magazine in UK la last year gave us a Studio Monitor of the Year award for, for one of our loudspeakers. And the thing is, there's no EQ thing you need with it. You can use it with any amplifier. It's it naturally flat. It's naturally time aligned because you don't need that. You don't have to have a delay to get your speakers in line. You can, um, and maybe they've done this with these horns. Maybe they've lined up the voice coils, so that they, they have a, a natural timing. Um, so as far as recommending studio monitors, well, we've made some speakers that are pretty nice, but I've also told you the design compromise that came into it. So um, if you've got a subwoofer on the floor, job done. Okay, and also I wanted to ask, uh, I'm a singer and I always have a hard time singing or uh, using a Shure SM58 because it's it makes the voice sound really harsh. I I just hate that microphone and it's everywhere. Yeah, it is. And you know why? It's the same thing I was talking about with the four kilohertz and the cut. It actually has what they call a presence boost. Yeah. So it makes the cut in the voice stronger. But if you already have it and... Well, I have it, but I want to, you know, yeah, but you put don't it away. So you don't need a mic that artificially boosts that part of your voice. Maybe try and you sh should try a load of microphones, and maybe sit in front of your of your monitors, not too close in case it feeds back, 
but just talking to it and see what you th and, and actually it's hard to know what your own voice sounds like but your friends will know and say well, all right which one makes me sound most like me that's what to do you if you if you i would think here where there's an opportunity to try different microphones you should do that um the SM58 has been around since the 70s, actually, and it's always had that presence boost. And I think it's great that you noticed it. But with a female voice, you really, you don't, you don't, you don't need need that that improvement because it's all it, it's a retrograde improvement at that point because yeah, you're it's making terrible. a spike. I, I hate it. it yeah, last night it was terrible. You know. Okay, I'm. Do you think that? Um, that you'll get a chance to do that. I mean, well, you know, may, maybe try a Bayer microphone or... A, uh, yeah, well, Neumann are, you know, they're really good. Um, there will be a microphone that doesn't have that presence boost. It's, um, did you know that sounds are cultural as well? Well, they used to be, it's less so now. And the, it, it's very reminiscent of an American sound, the, um, the SM58. Not so much these days, but it was very strong in the high mid. There's a certain well-known company that, that are still very strong with their high mid. And that's the thing that does the change that is in your head. Sorry, am I not talking into the microphone? Um, you'd, you'd think I'd know about that by now, wouldn't you? Um, there's another one. Uh, yeah, um, <coughs> I'm. I own a Pioneer 800. Don't shoot me, but I do have a reason. I know the sound quality. It does my head in, especially uh, the fact that um, an Allen and Heath mixer with you know, and Function One mixers are fantastic. Thank you. Um, no, honestly, genuinely love playing on your your mixers, especially when they're configured to the system as well. But the Allen and Heath ones, like the knobs and all the faders are crap, they're a real pain. But the Pioneer's got like, an um, you know, the effects is obviously something that I really like to use. But I'm trying to work out, and you might be able to have a resolution to my problem, because is there a signal path or a way that I can even internally modulate the Pioneer, you know, circuitry in order to rectify its sound? Because I know only from what I've heard, I've never actually looked into it, there is an internal limiter on Pioneers. Like you said, it gives it a stamp when it comes straight out of the speakers. So I'm just wondering if you might have a suggestion, because obviously I've thought of channeling a Pioneer into a good mixer and then out of the great system, but that, that's just a prolonged effect, I presume. It's the same problem, just with ac adding an extra chain to the yeah, path. Yeah, w once it's been degraded, you can't you can't bring it back. In fact, the more you do to it from that point, the worse it's going to get. So, what can you do with the Pioneer 800? I suppose you could you could go into it digitally, and that way you'd leave out the um, from a 1210. A 1210 from bit. like a record player. You see, it wouldn't be CDJ. Yeah, Technics like. Uh, uh, yeah. So you're going into a phono preamp. Uh, yeah, and generally from Serato as well, sometimes through vinyl too, but most of the time Serato. Most of the time Serato. <coughs> yeah, but he wants to use his 800. And his I, I really just want to use the effects of the 800. That's what it's all about. Like if, you know, if, you're, if you could maybe put in a few effects in your mixes, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> well, it, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, there's a there's there is a story about about that mix, and frankly, it was like pulling teeth. It was really really hard work with these guys, but they had a fantastic analog circuit on an old broadcast style mixer. That's how DJ mixers used to be um, in the 80s. And we said, look, if we could get if we could get at least a crossfader in this, um, you know, it would be it, it could be good because I'm suffering because I'm hearing. I mean, forget the 800, the 600 was actually an audio masher. I mean, it was a disgusting piece of equipment. <laughs> and I've actually told the Japanese engineers that to their faces, um, more or less. Um, and they were very apologetic, but, um, you know, that was nice. But the fact is, it's been destroying audio for a long time. 
um, the 800 at least became inoffensive, but it's got no real bass, and the sound comes out very, very flat indeed. There's no dimension left in it. Um, I, the, guy, the guy who did the, um, you know, one of the world standard mixers out there at Analog is the Midas XL4 and XL3. I mean, they're big, but you get a really nice juicy sound out, out of them. And uh, this guy went on to do XTA, these are the crossovers we use, and we gave him an 800 to see if he could do something with it. And he said, Tone, this, this mixer has not been built with a view to audio quality. It really has, and there's intrinsic stuff in there, like like the level of chip quality, the the level of the converters, very hard to get round. Um, uh, the 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 mixer we make actually you can put effects on it, but it's old school style where you send a, a signal out on a side chain and then bring it bring it back, and. Um, to be frank, I don't even understand it half the time. But certainly, it's not been taken up. But so you can use it with. He, um, he could connect his pioneer to your mixer then and just use the effects, right? No, well that's what you're we're right. Saying. You could, right? Oh yeah. yeah, Jesus, sorry, through like an auxiliary bus. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I thought you said something else. No, that was a, uh, that was a stroke of genius. It's blindingly obvious, but. <laughs> You could do that, yeah. Or maybe just get the effects box, because I think they do. I know, but the, the thing was with the 800, it was the only, um, it was the first Pioneer with, the, with a post echo. Everything before that was a pre echo. So when you used an echo effect uh, and then you stopped it, it killed it. You know, it didn't have an actual echo, just the effect stopped. Oh right, it didn't. But it in didn't the eight hundred, yeah. So it goes. Tss, 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 tss. Yeah, and that's the that's the only reason because from electronic mixing building up with a with a post echo, it's brilliant. You know what I mean? Because it adds another nuance to when the drop comes in. I'm sh I'm sure there's there's a way to do that with the formula sound. Yeah, I'm gonna look into it anyway. But sorry, I, I won't take up. No, it's know. cool then. Does it? You know, I don't. I'm happy. Hi, um, obviously we all spend a huge amount of time in clubs, all of us, and I just wonder how important is it to protect our ears and to wear plugs or... Yeah, it's incredibly, imp it really important because once they've been damaged, you never, you, you can't, can't go back. It doesn't repair. I guess you know that in the ear there's just all these tiny little bone hairs and if they get over stressed, they actually break. And when they're broken, that's when you get a ringing in your ears for a, a day or so afterwards. So the state, so th that's already too late in some regards. Although the brilliance of the human brain and body is that after you, you, w you will compensate to some extent for the damage that's done. But it's better not to have it done at all. And the, the warning that I remember when I was, when I was younger was um, that your, my ears used to tickle or start to itch a bit. And I think that's the moment you've either got to get the earplugs in or get out of the environment altogether. Because once it's happened, you, <coughs> it do, you can't, it doesn't repair. And the first things to go are the delicate ones, which of course are going to be the high frequencies, you know, with a wavelength that long and bass the size of a room. So I agree with you 100%. It's really, really important. You can get some nice plugs, I think, that um, mould to your ear, and they've got like a nine or a fifteen dB cut. Um, and a lot of a lot of DJs are mixing with earplugs these days, which um, seems kind of crazy. But um, I think they're doing it to get more bass, because that's what's left. Because you're not hearing the bass, you feel the bass, of course. But let's say you don't, you forgot your molded ones or you know you don't have them is it still a good idea to use any plugs yeah just to yeah absolutely seal it off? i mean i've rolled up bits of bits of tissue paper yeah, to put in my ear <laughs> um before now i've lost 20 percent of my left ear you you what i've left i've lost 20 percent of the base on my left ear of the base yeah that's interesting the frequencies on my left ear i can always hear a buzzing 
Yeah. Uh, so I, I put tissue sometimes. Sometimes, yes. What did you do? I just uh, DJ a lot, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was mm. always using my headphone on a loud, loud uh, volume on my left ear always. So maybe because of that. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I have a question, actually. Uh, all live musicians, I guess, are really scared with the feedback. So can you talk to us about a little bit about feedback, what causes it, how to prevent it? And uh, one of the reasons I get feedback is uh, when the guitar body, the acoustic guitar body, actually vibrates because uh, vibrates and resonates because of the uh, waves, not yeah, because well of the frequency. In a way, you, know? you, just you understand it already. Yeah, but, but uh, please tell us about it. I'm sure uh, everybody wants to maybe hear about Well, it. if you've got a speaker, fe feedback, I, I assume you're talking about feedback from a, from a loudspeaker. Yes, yeah. So the sound it's putting out is being picked up by something that's resonating, say like a guitar body um, or even a microphone. Um, I mean, I'm sure I can make this feedback if I put the microphone too hard near, near the speaker. Um, that's all it is, so it, it, it makes a loop. So it, it picks up the sound from the speaker and sends it back to the speaker again, so it just keeps getting louder and louder. Um, well, A, the level, but typically it would be at a specific frequency. That's why an on-stage monitor engineer, every, every single channel he's got, he's got graphic equalizers on it, because the thing is to try to take out the part that's feeding back without taking out the whole sound. I mean, yes, you can, you can get rid of the feedback by turning the whole thing down, but then you've lost the point of why you've got a monitor on stage. Um, so you have to try and take out little slices of it that are actually causing the trouble. So the idea is for a stage monitor, you try and make it as even and flat as possible. In fact, you should do that with any speaker because that's what the, the human likes. In fact, not necessarily absolutely flat. The old vinyl um, uh, cutting curve was a 3 dB per octave from the bass to the high frequencies. And that was like a very gentle slope to the highs um, is the thing that seems to be most pleasant to, to most, most humans. So nearly flat, but with, you know, with the bass a bit stronger. Sounds perfect to me. I, I was going to ask you something else, but I, I, I just want to follow that up. I'm over here. Hi. Uh, and uh, is it likely that that uh, systems that are sort of boosting um, high mid frequencies, SM58s that are boosting high mid frequencies and cheap monitor stage wedges that are boosting high mid frequencies, like that's a feedback generating combination. Because that seems to be like the main yeah. delay in my sound checks throughout my career, waiting for the singer to get away from the wedges because this is the signal chain. This is where it's creating feedback. Okay. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think you just spelt it out, really. Um, quite often it is. It I is just had to things. say it out loud, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> get it off my chest. <laughs> yeah. But I was really going to ask you something else, sorry. Okay. Uh, um, um, uh, do you honestly, or like, are you serious about uh, people who spend time in loud environments should always protect their ears every time they're in a loud environment? Yeah, I think, yeah. I think, I think, I think they should. You see, now here's a, but it's nothing's quite that straightforward. Distortion causes far more damage than level. And typically, things, things are, yeah, in a club, of course they're loud. I mean, you know, <laughs> me and, and all the other people who do engineering have spent years trying to get DJs to keep the signal out of the red. Because most mixers won't stand being in the red. That's why it's red. It's red is saying, I'm, I'm absolutely um, full up. I can't take any more. In fact, I'm going to throw all my toys out the fucking pram because this is stupid. Um, um, and, and that's it. That's what's coming out of the mixer, completely distorted. How can anybody do anything with it at that point? It doesn't matter how good the sound system is because the sound system is only there to faithfully supposedly, faithfully reproduce what you give it. So the, a reasonable sound guy is not going to let his speakers get blown to pieces. He's going to have a limiter or a compressor on the system because this is what happens. Um, all sorts of really um, 
professional and famous people drive their mixers in the red. So we're not even struggling with whether a pioneer is not very good compared with a formula sound. We're actually struggling with the way people drive things um, most of the time. It's, they say, well, red does not mean I'm on. It means I'm suffering, and therefore all, <laughs> all these people that are, list that are being subjected to this audio are also suffering. And it's, it's quite staggering, but this is the truth. And I've tried to say it nicely in one of my, uh, one of my um, I mean, this has been more an interview and a, a more relaxed thing, and I much prefer this, but I have done things where I've just written it all out and told people, put, put slides up and showed bit rate and sample rate and trying to get an awareness of gain structure and what clean sound is and, and, wh and why the hell is it important anyway. And I hope maybe I've got across to you that it's staggeringly important because it's the doorway to another part of our consciousness. Or it can be. It won't be if, it, if it's horrible and dirty and messed up, which I have to say, most of the time it is. You don't get it in live concerts. You, get it, you, you don't get it in many clubs. A place like Cielo, for instance, in New York, where you've got an owner who is completely tuned into this whole story, and he soundproofed the whole, well, sound treated the whole of the room. He's, he's got us in, he, um, he's got a formula sound. He uses it whenever he can, but people will come along and say they've got to have an 800. But most of the time, he's controlling it and keeping it, keeping it good. And, and he knows about the MP and the three and the WAV thing. So look at the reputation the club's got. And it, it's not like this is, um, something really special. It's, it's just where a bit of intelligence and proper understanding has been applied for once. Because an audio chain is only as good as the weakest part of the story. If, you, if you've got a series of gates and one is only half open, that will be the speed that people can, can, can get through it. And that's it. You only need one bad part in the whole story to bring it all down, like the wrong microphone or a crappy sound card, or I don't know, a mixer that's in the red. Any, I mean, I think I'm beginning to get across to you just how delicate this thing is. It is delicate. It's not just whack it up and get it out. You know, when you're dealing with a, a sensory system that can, that can sort things out from time differences of 15 to 20 millionths of a second, I think that deserves respect myself. It's taken... It's taken billions of years to evolve it to this point. Um, did you know, for instance, <laughs> that all the oxygen that we breathe was put here by three billion years of cyano cyanobacteria? All the oxygen on Earth has come from, um, it's the waste product of cyanobacteria. And it wasn't until they learned to process oxygen, which is a much faster rate of um, metabolism than anything else. In fact, the human brain is, um, uses up more energy than just about anything else in the world. Um, it's a phenomenally powerful piece of processing equipment. If you're, if you're up the side of a mountain, the first thing you'll do is get something on your head um, because you lose so much heat out of the top of your head, probably why we've got hair, um, because there's so much energy required just for this thing to exist and work. Um, and we're only using a fraction of it. And really. there was one more question in the back, right? It's nothing to do with audio, but <laughs> 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 but it is. <laughs> it's all intertwined. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, functioning ones can't be brought upstairs. That's what I this I heard or something like like the design. Is there a way that it can be because it's so heavy to like make it? Less <laughs> heavy. <laughs> <laughs> this, well, this guy in LA like comes and installs it in clubs, but he can't bring it upstairs or something. Like that's what his <laughs> own only criteria is. Like the club has to be floor level because he said it's it's too heavy or something. Oh, well, okay. Well, <laughs> well, maybe <laughs> he just you know he's taken something half the size of this. And some of our stuff is bigger than that. Well, see, 
Yeah, mar marketing has got a lot to answer for. There's no question. It's a confusion on, it's a blight on the face of the earth and the people's intelligence. Yeah, I mean, to be perfectly frank about it, we've been designing equipment to go in trucks since the 70s. Since probably some, before some of the people who were saying this kind of thing were even born. We were already thinking about a truck pack. So, you know, um, I think we do understand about keeping the size and the weight down. Do you know one of the biggest problems hit the speaker people at the moment is the, um, is the price of neodymium. It's gone up by a factor of five times. And why, why is this relevant? It is relevant to your question because neodymium is a material with some of the highest magnetic coercivity. In other words, how much magnetism can it hold? It is the, it's way out in front of everything else. Mm. Um, so therefore, you can make quite, quite good horsepower speakers with very lightweight magnets. Well, suddenly they're all in wind generators and hybrid cars, and over the years, the Chinese pricing has driven everybody else out of the business. So suddenly, they've captured the market, and the price of neodymium is now, well, the price of neodymium in, in, in one of our 21-inch loudspeakers is about $375, before we've even started to put metal around it and turn it into a magnet. And it was costing, Sixty-five dollars. So that's that's happened in the last couple of years, and they're probably not even going to allow export of it soon. So anyway, there's people out there now beavering away, opening up neodymium mines in other parts of the world, but it's going to take a while. And there was one more in the back. I'm sorry to take up time, but I have to ask you this question. I have like 50 million questions to ask you, but as a designer. Right, um, she brought this up, and, and you were just talking about it. Like, I could sit and design the most beautiful system, put gold leads on everything, gold wires. But in the real world, I have to sell this product, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how much does the real world, uh, let me just say, th that I'm actually selling this, come into play when you're designing? Because a lot of times I can design a system, but then it, it'll be, you know, eighty million dollars, and the client's not going to buy it. Like. How much does that come into your thought when you're actually designing, or do you design and then try to scale back? I'm talking about like real world application of trying to sell something real world commerce. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, hmm. further up the story than maybe the commerce side is, you know, you know, the 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 natural instinct. Well, for me, to use to get the most out of the minimum amount of materials. So. From an engineering point of view, not overcomplicated, try to come up with elegant solutions um, that use the least amount of wood and loudspeakers. That's why efficiency is important, because if you can get a very good con a good conversion of electrical to audio output, you don't need so many speakers right there. So all these considerations come into it. It's um, the cosmetics that we have are have its case of form following function um, and the story around function one about that actually but um, it we've never done anything to any of our speakers to um, actually go uh, let's put some bling into it because it would be more attractive right now Anne is experimenting with um, black lacquer and and various finishes for some of the smaller products because a lot of people right now want to put our small speakers in their homes and they quite like them to look pretty, fair enough. Um, but the look of Function One it is actually the, des the engineering that's, that's made it look like that. I wasn't saying gold leads for the look, I was saying it for the transmission of the sound. Ah. Or, or to say that I could design the best sounding speaker but it may cost too much for the average person so I have to take into account, like the young lady said, you know, how th can a person purchase this? Yeah. Um, no, we don't. There's no limits on on what we put out there, purely on cost. We'll if we have to spend money on a part to get it and, and we can see a, a performance result, we definitely will use it, um, for sure. Because that's that's what makes us happy, is to is to get it as good as we possibly can. You know, um, it, it's my way of contributing to the to the world, if you like, um, to enjoy music. So are, are you publicly traded? 
No. Okay, great. That's fine. Okay. No, <laughs> not at all. I mean, um, the seven the seven partners and uh, all together there's fifteen people involved. Yeah. Yeah, I am. There, there's, there's, there's still some more. Um, keep finding those dirty windows and trying to get cleaner. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm on with a new, with a new generation of stuff, and I never expected to. Um, the thing we started in the mid '70s has been through. There was a TMS series when we were a dominant force all over the world with the in the in live world. With um, in the '80s, we would do. I mean, we did every. We did. The Pink Floyd, for instance, you know, it, it was it was very very successful as a live system. Um, that was, if you like, the first generation. The second was uh, what we called Flashlight, and I think that's actually what the Pink Floyd used. And now we have something called Resolution. But I can go back to 1975, and there's a line of development that's come all the way through. And see, um, there's a, I think there's something on slices where they've just taken out a bit where they've not actually put the questions in that I got, but I put this up on the web where I'm saying I've got no respect for the other manufacturers. Well, the reason I say this is because, um, yeah, it was a, well, a, it was a question, but B, the, um, Christian Heil, Vidos, he, he did this line array thing, and up to a point it has some evenness of dispersion, which people enjoy, but it was a line, so it would fit into, um, you know, theatrics and stage sets, much better than a point source cluster. So we went from a three-dimensional approach to sound to a two-dimensional approach. To me, that's not going forward, which is why I won't do it. And there's lots of other problems which I won't bore you with. But um, he got a lot of success with that. And everybody else in the world suddenly was doing line arrays. Every other manufacturer. They didn't have their own thing. They're not thinking about, where can I take this to? They're just thinking, this is selling, we better make one, two, just the same. And of course, there isn't, it's, it's an arrangement of the same components. It's not, there's no great componentry development in it. It's just arrangement of multiple speakers. So, um, and everybody else has done it. So of course I haven't got any respect, because I think that if you're really into this, then you, you follow, because it's not a done deal. Who said this, the development in this area was over? It's not. It's it's been ongoing. When I started in it, it was a pioneer. It was the the land of pioneers, and the people who were involved in it then um, are are very different, or were very different, <laughs> from the people involved in it now. It, it's a different mentality. Um, it's not being driven by the artistic elements, the production values. It's being driven by politics, and um, all the vested interests that creep into anything that humans seem to get up to. And, you know, in other words, it's corrupt. Um, how to get lots of high frequency um, from multiple units without it going to pieces and comb filtering and because the wavelengths are so short, um, as soon as you separate two things by a, a wavelength, they, they see themselves as separate sources, so therefore they start arguing. When things are one, they can't argue. So you, there's, it, it's funny, it's a bit like people. When, they, when they're close in their family, they can get into real arguments. <laughs> if they're far enough away, <laughs> it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> if they're really, really close, <laughs> then they can't because they never get far enough apart. So I don't, I, I don't know, I think about this kind of madness, but. Um, I do, I do see that the, see, because high frequencies are so delicate that the, the things that reproduce them also have to be delicate. And so the idea of a thousand watt tweeter is just, it, it, you know, it's an anathema. You can't, you can't, it's not going to work. Because for a voice coil to take a thousand watts, it's going to weigh, weigh a lot. And as soon as something weighs a lot, how on earth is it going to go backwards and forwards at 18,000 times a second? Yeah? So that's, that's a problem that, um, 
nobody's really cracked. Liner A puts them all in a line, but they're still interfering like mad, and that's why you don't get any audio out of the Liner A much above 8K, because most of it is cancelled. All the really, all what I would call air, you know, the air in, um, in a sound system, stuff above 12K, um, it's not there, it's all gone. It's all right, though, because, I mean, you know, a telephone only goes to about 5K and, or is it, what is it, 500 to 5K, and you, um, you can understand what's going on. But this is not an audio experience. This is just about hearing what somebody's saying. <laughs> not at all. Just can you pass the mic? There is one. <laughs> I'm going to take it first. Um, with audio perception um, uh, connected to certain uh, listening modes, what would you consider a proper listening mode for your sound systems? And uh, more importantly, uh, do you think that uh, people in a club situation are aware of that? Of this and that? Well, I mean, for instance, in a club situation, you could have a four point system or you can have a two point. And um, if you if you crisscross the stereo, which um, we've always done um, on a four point, it's uh, it's more interesting spatially than just two. Um, outside is always good because you don't have a you don't have a room painting itself all over the audio. You know, it's um, it's much better to be outside if you can. It's much, much purer experience. Um, but uh, other than that, I, I, I can't well, think like of anything. I mean, let's say we, we have like a dance floor full of like 500 uh, drunk people, you know? Uh, are they really, do, they, do you think they notice like what effort um, got like into the, to the loudspeakers or is it? You mean, do you think they notice the difference in loudspeakers? Is that Th what? That's the question. I mean, like yeah. Uh, yes, I do. Very, very much so. I don't think that we would, considering that we, we should we say, fight against fashion that we don't agree with, um, it, you know, we wouldn't be successful if uh, unless there was enough people um, appreciating the differences. But I, th I think you meant right in an immediate situation, then and there, right? Not about the club owner who wants to have a good sound system, but yeah. Yeah. Um, no, sorry, he, mean, he I, means. Have he I got the question wrong? I think he means the bottom line of it is if someone at the end of the night in the club with his 500 drunken friends notices a difference. Yeah, I think I think I think they will, Beca because yeah yeah okay. And I think you s I think you stated it very very well. Actually, you know, depending upon the kind of drugs involved, um, one one should be actually more sensitive to it. Frankly, um, I think you know that's it's really important when your perception is heightened to actually have it pure and clean, because you know you don't. Um, it's a vexation. Bad sounds vexation to to the spirit. There's no doubt.
Well, firstly, I'm not so sure that they don't. Um, and even if they don't consciously care about it, it's still going to affect them. And Oh, yeah, I do. I so do. Some people don't know any better either, probably. You know, I mean, that's a part of it. Like, I suddenly you hear a good system, and, like, it's hard to go back to a bad one. Uh, you know? Absolutely. Like good food. True. You eat yeah. McDonald's every day. Suddenly you start having some real food, and, like, McDonald's, you're just like, how did I eat that before? True. I don't know. True. Yeah. It's the bar keeps going up. So, actually, what we may be talking about is, is there, um, you could say, is there any point in striving for excellence in life when... <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the real question. In a, in a way. Um, <laughs> I have, I have, I have a, I have a. <laughs> I mean, all past you, man. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but I have. There's another question, right? I have, a, I have a fun, I have a fun question here. I'm just, um, you mentioned Cielo earlier. Um, just curious as to like, you know, I'm sure there's a good number of clubs around the world that have function one sub systems, but I'm sure you probably have your particular favorites. Um, just curious as to what. E yeah, and CLO is, is one definitely one of them. Right, any any others that come to mind? Yeah, Space was really good this Where's that? this year. Um, Ibiza. Oh, okay. I'm really pleased with the outcome there. What with the soundproofing and the roof and the new system, it all came together really good. Um, uh, we do the we do the Glade um, Electronic Music Festival. We try and do some ambient sonic um, surround sound experiments there. But we're still waiting for a sufficient um, separate channels <laughs> to do something really good. Um, I mean, we did Glastonbury one year, but that's another. That's another. Actually, don't go there. No, won't go there. Um, but we did do Glastonbury from about 1979 up until 93. Um, and, and I was personally a lot to do with the the, the, f the, the, the founding of that festival, actually. And I know all the characters involved, and I could tell you some <laughs> horrible stories. Squeezing the life out of music. Well done. <laughs> Brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, I didn't mention that, did I? Um, yeah, well, that's exactly what's happening. Um, because there seems to be this idea that um, you've got to be half a dB louder than the track that came on the radio before you're going to get played. And of course, that's a one-way ticket to hell because um, if everybody keeps trying to do that, there's, um, there's a track I really, I really liked, a more recent dance track, I mean, in my terms anyway, um, which would be uh, is it Bob Sinclair, Children of the Sky. I like the idea, I like the groove, I like everything about it. I tried, I've tried three times to get a decent copy of that, of that track. And um, I thought the first one was a bootleg and it must be because it can't be really re it released this bad. So I got another one, same thing, got another one, same thing. When I put it into SoundForge and, and look at the, and look at the waveform, it tells me that it's 0.1 of a dB off clip. And when you look at the waveform, it's all flattened off at the top. And it sounds disgusting. And it's, it's unplayable. As much as I love it, I can't play it. Because they were suffering from this delusion that they had to be louder than somebody else. Um, if, if the person listening wants it louder, there's a thing called a volume control on most audio equipment. A uh, bit of consolation. Um, hi, Tony. I'm, I'm over here. Apparently, in the last year or two, there's been um, a little bit of a backlash against that. Good. So <laughs> they're, they're trying to sort of ease it back a little bit just to keep things a little bit kind of well true to the original sort of uh, mixing uh, engineer idea. Yes. A little bit. 
good. Yeah, no, there, there, there was, wasn't there? There was, um, there was, wasn't there a day back in March or something? Um, oh, really? Yeah, I think it's, I the, it's the idea is gathering momentum. Yeah, you, I Sweet. mean, you've got guys who are skilled in the art and really understand it. They're just leaving the business because they can't stand it anymore because they get no creative satisfaction out of their part of the story. They're getting bullied by the rest of the Because they're being forced yeah. to cram everything yeah. into a dynamic range of 2 dB. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It is. So what we get, uh, one thing you could all get out of this is that humans, no matter how are fully capable of behaving absurdly and nowhere do they do it more than in audio. And the things people say about about speakers, audio, the way to do things, most of it is nonsense. Find out for yourselves. Knowledge is power. Y you don't want to be beholden to somebody who, who, who got it from some marketing guy who's twisting the story in the first place um, or his mate who, who just said something. Because um, that's how most of it works, I'm afraid. And yeah, you got to get your own mind. Very, very important. Brands start buying WAVs. Um, since you said that human ear is designed primarily to human voice, do you have any personal theory why we all get sold easily on a nice fat face? <laughs> Why we like a nice fat face? Well, yeah, it's a good, it's a, it's a good question. And okay, um, I think it's um, within us. I think it's in our in our genes, if you like, because in um, in history, big bass would be coming from thunderstorms, which when you're a kid are certainly scary, um, uh, volcanic activity or earthquakes. In other words. And more recently, explosions, I guess, bombs. And all of these things are something you really need to pay attention to. So I would suggest that that human beings come with a r adrenaline reaction to big bass. And um, certain, f and I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of octaves in bass too. If you start at 20, you've only got to go to 40 to have a whole octave. Then you go to 80 and you've got another octave. And then 160, that's another octave again. So as you're getting into mid-bass, you've already got three octaves to play with, um, which goes under the heading of bass. It's, it's, it's more ornate than, than it feels, you know, than it sounds like. Um, most material you get, you're lucky if anything goes down to 40. Um, quite rare. Most people think that 40 hertz is 25 or 30 hertz. I did until I really experienced it. So there's a whole nother level below what we typically have got in space called infrabase. Um, and that goes down to, well, it goes down to like seven hertz. The visceral, the vibration of the visceral cavity is, um, well, I'm sure it's different for, every, for, for different people, but it's around seven hertz. And if you could vibrate a person at seven hertz, they will disintegrate internally um, with enough power. And, it, um, and people have done it. There was a French guy at the turn of the last century who made a, a huge whistle that vibrated at seven hertz and he, he killed himself <laughs> when he switched it on. It's really true. It happens. <laughs> um, so, so it's really, so I guess we've only really had big bass since, since the 70s uh, that we can, you know, that isn't um, an explosion or, or something dangerous. So I think we still have that, you know, that reaction to it. I think we also like our, our molecules being um, vibrated and, you know, it's a, it's a kind of massaging effect. Um, with earplugs, I've been close to um, 14 double 21s um, at the Prago Tour Arena and I've actually felt the air being sucked in and out of my lungs. I mean, my eyeballs were going all over the place, but I mean, I never, I never actually had it where it's taking the air in and out of you. Um, 
that was, and I was quite enjoying it. But I, f I figured that um, I shouldn't do it for too long, because <laughs> it, wa it was strong. <laughs> so, do we have any more questions? <laughs> 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 well, I've no doubt that no, we don't. Is the short answer. We don't. We quite like to, but you know, there's only so many of us. There's so much time. Um, remember KLF, um, Jimmy Corti. We did it. We, we did an armored personnel carrier for him once with a big sound, with a big sound system on it. Have you done any any dark music? Any? Yes. People, people you invite to listen to your new speakers and then you trust them with their uh, judg judgment. Yeah. 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 We, we, we solicit opinion from everybody, um, in fact. And when we have our demo rooms um, at the Troy place. <laughs> <laughs> but your hearing is gone on one ear, you know, so. <laughs> No, you'd be perfect, wouldn't you? You'd be, be no QC problems there, then. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, then. Sorry. Please give it up for Tony Andrews.